Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with Hernando County Extension, and today I have my regular co-host, Lily Browning, on, who finally figured out how to make her microphone <laughs> work this morning. Good morning, everybody. Just in Yay. time. We can all hear you now. Yay. <laughs> you might be sorry about that, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to make me regret it now, huh? <laughs> And today we have a very, very special guest. Dr. Whitney Elmore is the County Extension Director from Pasco County Extension right next door, just a little bit south of us. So it's a little bit warmer there yep. on these chilly mornings, but not yep. by a whole lot. Yep. Good morning. Good morning, Whitney. How are you doing? I am doing well, and thank you all for having me. Oh, well, thank you very much for coming on. I know that uh, your schedule is just as busy as... Mine probably, no, yours is probably a whole lot busier than mine because you have more responsibility. Hey, this, this is the fun stuff we get to do. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Everybody's exactly. learning a new world. <laughs> For real. Every day, <laughs> every day is different. <laughs> okay. Well, for anybody who's on here, I see that we have, where's my little indicator? One person on good morning. Feel free to go ahead and type in a comment and say good morning. And of course, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. If you have pictures that go with your questions, let me go on here. You can go ahead and email them to me really quick. There's my email, wlester at ufl.edu. And if you email me pictures, I should be able to screen share them on here all depending on if I can make the technology work today or not. So early this morning, I did have some pictures sent to me. So let's go ahead and start with that. And see if I could screen share those. We'll dig into Bill's email here. Can you guys see that okay? Yes. Okay, yeah, you can see that. So this is from Irene, and I think Irene is one of our regular viewers. Hopefully, she's that one person that's currently <laughs> on watching us live right now while we go ahead and look at her pictures of her shrubs and answer her question. And it's a really good thing that we have Whitney on here today because Whitney is a plant pathologist, so she knows all about plant diseases. Mm -hmm. So if you have any really hard plant disease questions, go ahead and send them in now and I can make her answer them for you. Aren't you a plant pathologist too, Dr. Lester? <laughs> yeah, kind of, sort of, on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we have double the knowledge. Exactly. So today should be plant disease day, technically, I guess. <laughs> All right, so we've so got our holly said, here. She's concerned about her hollies. There are parts just dying. We have a whole row of them. Uh, just a few seem affected. I have looked closely and do not see any bugs, scale, or perceive a difference of value. We're concerned about whatever is happening. We could lose them all. And please help us if you can. And I'm sure we're going to be able to help in one way or another. So she has two pictures here. One's a holly that looks a little bit dead in the center. Oh, it's yeah, sad. And the other one's a sad holly. Mm -hmm. The Charlie Brown holly. It's a very exactly. sad <laughs> Bless its art. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. All right. My eyes are not quite what they used to be. My screen is teeny tiny here. So yeah. uh, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get a good look at what are you seeing there, Bill? Anything standing out to you besides loss of vigor or no vigor at all here? Yeah, this one, I think te the technical term is it is failing to thrive. Mm -hmm. And it's a little hard to see um, because there's no real, real close-up pictures here as far as could it be a scale because scales are a little hard to see sometimes. They tend to be on the stems a lot of times. And they just look like little bumps. Yeah, a lot of times stems. they'll just look like something natural to the plant, they blend themselves in so very well. Um, and, you know, that would be one of my first 
um, indications. I mean, I, you know, if you've got just a handful, it would be interesting to know if they're in a row, you know, how, you know, which ones are affected. Um, is it all of them? Are they in a sequence or is it kind of more random down through there? Um, you know, a, a variety of questions. I don't know if Irene is, is on, if, if she could jump in and answer that particular question. So there's a few different things that that could go on there. Sometimes, like like Bill was referring to, a failure to thrive could be in planting. Um, you know, if it's not the right plant in the right place, they're going to struggle um, over time. But I, I would love to see some, some close-ups that would help. I really don't suspect disease um, at all by looking at this. It doesn't have hallmarks of disease. Of course, it's not you know, I'm not close up on it, but uh, yeah, um, I, I think I'm with you, Bill, that, you know, potential for scale there. I don't know. Can, Bill, on your end, can you um, can you zoom in or anything kind of on some of that middle middle stuff there? We do. You know, there are some diseases that will cause um, some failures that that twigging almost somewhat of a witch's broom effect, which is usually a little bit more out on the tips and, and what we sometimes call flagging. And you'll see that kind of random appearance of problems throughout a plant, especially early on. Um, but the hollies overall are pretty tough too. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, from a disease standpoint, there's not a lot that's going to affect them to this extent. So I would suspect either we've got a problem in planting or we've got a problem over here with, with insect and scale is, is, is a good, potential. Um, and I think what a lot of people, you know, typically they, they automatically think disease when they see a plant suffering. Disease, luckily, is not the norm. It's one of the last things that I tend to suspect. Um, first, it's typically a cultural problem, like wrong plant in the wrong place. Then I tend to look more at, you know, uh, insect issues. Disease is usually the last. So I really don't think it's any kind of disease there. Um, if it's possible to get some close-ups of some of the twigs and of the stems, we might be able to to um, make a more definitive um, answer there. Um, <clears throat> you know, what I like to have people do is give me some close-ups, give me some views of the plant, and then step back into the landscape and give me a shot kind of of the whole picture mm -hmm. where I know where the plants are at um, in relation to each other, in relation to the house. Um, and that tells me if, if it's the wrong plant in the wrong place. So, um, I, you know, the other thing, did Irene, and again, my eyes, Bill, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, did she happen to mention in there how old, how long these had been there or anything? No, she didn't. And I know that's one of the first things that I ask people mm -hmm. because sometimes people will say, I have uh, an entire hedge and some of the plants are beginning to die or look bad. And I'll ask them, how old are they? And they say, well, we bought the house 30 years ago and the hedges were already mature when we moved in. Yeah. And, you know, landscape material, you know, bushes and hedges and flowering plants like this generally have a lifespan of 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it varies quite a bit. It varies with exactly, you know, where they're planted mm -hmm. and how you're caring for them. But uh, hedges every summer we see a few of them succumb to root rots also yeah it mostly happens with the really really old ones that have been there for 20 years or longer and it's a little hard to tell me well i'm i have the advantage of i'm, I'm able to look at it in my email and get a little bit better look here yeah. so, is it on is it on an irrigation system how deep is that mulch that's around mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. it right up against the trunk to it mm -hmm. um was this one planted too deeply and, well, then, and, is, and yeah. is this one a replacement? Right. Yeah. Because yeah. It yeah. Is, is it a newer one small. that replaced the dead one? Yeah. Yeah. Is it, it looks very small compared to the two next to it. So I wonder if this is not a replacement for one that did perish. And again, Bill, and I think you hit the, the nail on the head. You know, when we, when, when we install our trees and our shrubs, we look at those as long-term investments. And they are. They really are for a living thing that we put out into the environment, but they don't live forever. Um, sometimes they can um, inch along, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, and suffer for many, many years and slow decline. 
Um, you know, but, but they do, they have a lifespan just like any other species on the planet. Some are short lived, some are very, very long lived in comparison to, to humans. So we do see plants just natural causes um, going downhill and, and that's a, an indication to replace. Looking at this particular picture, and again, I, you know, I hesitate to make a definitive diagnosis when I, I don't have all of all of the answers. You know, looking at that plant, it looks like it is suffering some what appears to be nutrient issues because of a lot of yellowing. I don't think that is because it's not necessarily being fertilized or something. I think the life could be getting sucked out of it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do think that the scale is probably up here at, at potentially number one. Um, you know, culturally, there could be some issues here. It was maybe planted too deep. Um, like Lily said, and the mulch is, is too close. Um, you know, there's a variety of things that we need to look at. I, I would love to, to pick Irene's brain and be able to, to give her a better um, diagnosis. I mean, when it comes to the scales, though, um, and there are a variety of them, and Irene, if you're listening, or, or anybody else, um, scales are piercing and sucking insects, and they go through a few different life cycles, and they can have a different appearance to them. Um, kind of hard, again, to, to pick out, um, but if you look closely along those stems, um, and little twigs, you, you may see these little branches, little things that look like, you know, little bumps. Um, and some of them, they look like little clamshells almost that are kind of stuck down to the branch. And you won't be able to pick these things off um, very easily at all. And, um, you know, depending on the scale, depending on the plant, um, you can come in with some um, systemic insecticides that will move up through the roots and into the plant. There are some sprays that you can put on, um, a couple of different ones, different mechanisms that, that have the ability to, to kill them. But it's a long process. You don't kill scale overnight mm -hmm. um, and get it under control. Um, but again, before, Irene, if you're listening, before you put anything out, um, if you can, get some get some other pictures in, some close-ups to, to Lily or Bill and um, let them make sure that that's that that's there. We don't want to put pesticides out unless we are sure um, that that's what we're dealing with. Um, but you know, looking at those other plants on each side and things, I, I'm not so sure that that this is a cultural issue. Um, if it were that they're planted too close to the house, or you've got pH issues or something, I would suspect to see all of them failing in pretty much the same rates. Yeah. Um, but because you've got some here and there that are in different stages of this, possibly, um, very, very likely we're looking at, at an insect issue. Yeah. So, Irene, if you can, uh, I, not, I have absolutely no idea if Irene lives in Hernando County or not, because you realize that we have regular viewers from Fernando County and Pasco, Broward County, Pinellas, uh, as a matter of fact. Duval. Cindy's on here, one of our regular viewers from Pinellas County. We get questions from there. We get a lot of tropical fruit questions here. We are just Pinellas having that County. discussion, weren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we get asked a little bit of everything. So when you're asking a question, try to remember to say which county you're in because the answer for Marion County is going to be really mm -hmm. different than Broward County, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to tropical fruit. Yeah. And There's Tallahassee. Wow. That's very yeah, different. Yeah. I bet you, I bet you, buddy's a little cool, cold right now. <laughs> yeah, a little chillier up there than it is here. You know, it's an interesting point too because now that kind of these these county walls are are down, state walls are down. You know, some of our virtual programs, we've had people from other nations yeah. that that are coming in, and I mean, it makes total sense. University of Florida Extension. This is this is the experts, folks. And these are the ones to turn to. And what it comes down to is we all tend to be pretty specialized for our regions. Um, and it, But if we can't answer it based on where you're located, we can help you get to those folks that can. And mm -hmm. we always recommend if you're in Washington State, let's say, you've got county extension agents that are there that are specialized like we are um, here in our particular 
parts of Florida that can help you. We are we are all about help. We're we're service all the way, and we'll try to help as best we possibly can. But the best information yeah. is going to be local information because there are large variabilities. Pasco County, a good example. Pasco County is a large county. We sit on the coast, um, just north of Tampa Bay here. Over on the west side of the county, vegetation is completely different than it is. I live here in Land Lakes, than it is here in Land Lakes, than it is over on the east side where our office is located in Dade City. Temperatures vary two, three degrees very easily. North of the county, south of the county, very, very different environments. And each, each home can have a microclimate surrounding it as well. And when you're talking about things like cold protection and whatnot, one or two degrees makes a huge difference. So knowing where you're located gives us a really good indication of how best to help you um, at the same time. And, you know, believe it or not, there are um, insects and diseases and stuff that you only find in a handful of places that we know of, at least at this time. So sometimes there are things we're not incredibly familiar with. We've just not, we've just not come across them um, and, and had to, to deal with them and study them. But, uh, you know, your extension service is, is your go-to um, in your, your, local, your local space, but we're absolutely happy to help. Um, there are some things that are universal, like right plant, right place. Right. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you're at. And those Florida-friendly landscaping principles, those nine principles, apply across the board regardless of where you're at and and that's kind of nice and i've done some national presentations where i'm like you know it did and the title was something like it doesn't matter where you're from they still apply right, right. yeah you know? that's right yeah tennessee has the same program today. it's called tennessee yards and neighborhoods yeah mm -hmm. and i think they might have a couple more principles but the original nine are exactly the same mm -hmm. so, absolutely yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and i will the thing I hear quite often, Whitney, to where I use it as a saying now, thing I hear all the time, but my friend in Newport Ritchie. Oh, yeah. Everybody has a friend in Newport Ritchie. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that friend can grow Royal Poinciana or, you know, these more southern or the more, you know, tropical type plants. And like, well, then why can't we? <laughs> kind of. Yeah. And, you know, Bill and I were just talking while Lily was having her, her microphone issues uh, <laughs> before we get started. We were, we were just talking about, you know, um, yesterday morning um, was the first day here in Land Lakes. We'd had a, a pretty good frost. Um, and I know folks just to our north, I mean, just, I don't know, five miles north of me, maybe have already had two, maybe. Yeah, this is our um, second one we've had here yeah. in Hernando. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, it, it distance, tiny mm -hmm. distances make a huge difference. And, um, you know, when talking this time of the year about cold protection, cold damage, what to do and not to do, basically, folks, leave them alone. Yeah. Um, the best thing, leave them alone. Live um, with the ugly. That's what I say. Live with it. Absolutely. Um, until after the threat of frost. Heading into spring before you do anything. No fertilizer, no pruning. No pruning. Right. right. Um, I've but, been preaching uh, that for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, just, just deal with it. Just deal with it. It's okay. It's protective. Um, you know, let, right. them, let them go and dormant. Let them go to sleep. Let them protect themselves as much as you can. But Bill and I were just talking, you know, we kind of peruse the, the Facebook pages throughout the region and stuff just to kind of see what folks are talking about. Um, see how we can help here and there. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm always amazed at, um, especially for Central Florida, is the amount of folks that are growing tropical fruits um, and vegetables, tropical mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables. And, you know, and, and, and I've been seeing this flurry the last few days. Uh-oh, you know, plants on the ground. You know, is it going to make it? Probably not. Right. Uh, you know, if it's if it's down, if it's brown and it's down, it's very likely. Yeah. It's not gonna make <laughs> if it's it. brown and down, it could yeah. be in trouble. And I mean, potential that it could. Um, right. You know, I've had some of my plants that are not even really subtropicals get bit, and it take them years after a hard freeze or something to come back. So patience is really key. But we're really in Central Florida in a very unique place even for florida we've got 
really kind of five distinct climates across the state is the way that, that I look at it. And Central Florida is very different because people try to take tropicals and subtropicals. We are not subtropical here, folks. We're not. Um, you know, that's more Miami type areas is mm -hmm. down in the subtropical um, zone. But we're trying to push some of these plants out of their comfort zones. The great majority, if it's not native right. to Central Florida, we're really pushing um, yeah. Just like with temperate plants from just further north, like Tallahassee area even, we're pushing those plants to survive a pretty harsh environment, especially in summer. Um, heavy, heavy, heavy rains, intense heat and humidity is hard on a lot of those temperate plants. With those tropicals and subtropicals, the smallest bit, of, you get down below 45 or 50 for many of these plants and, and they could be done very easily. It doesn't take 30s to kill many of these or to severely damage them. So we're really compressing more northern and temperate and, and tropical and subtropical from the south in central Florida. And we're pushing them. We're pushing these plants beyond their comfort zones. It's not to say you can't grow these things here, but it is is very likely seven eight years out of ten they'll be fine right. one or two they're gonna they're gonna mm -hmm. bite the dust or be Queen damaged palms. Queen palms. absolutely mm -hmm. the palms are a perfect example we really push um the palms here i mean bismarck's bismarck's mm -hmm. are pretty hardy um some parts of pasco county not gonna make it other parts absolutely so right. you're pushing you're pushing Right. Um, on these things, but you've got to, before you're going to take that risk of installing these things, understand there's there's a risk, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you're pushing them past their limits. And how are you going to try to mitigate that? Um, if you don't want to lose them, how are you going to try to protect them, um, you know, in, in these harsh environments? And it, it takes some effort. Yeah, you really I need to have a plan some. in advance and know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. Um, I know somebody north of here in Citrus County that has a lot of tropicals, but he keeps it either in a greenhouse or he has yeah. a way of keeping it warm. And he understands that if we have a devastating freeze or cold front, then all bets are off. He may very well lose some things. Mm -hmm. but I, I, talk to, I like to talk to people. I'm Whitney, I'm sure you do also with so many people moving to the area from up north. Oh, my gosh. They want to grow apples. They want to grow yeah. lavender. Yes. Okay, those, guys, lavender does not do well in Central Florida. Those Maybe are the, the winter two, for a while. Yes, and I do know some people that do grow it. Mm -hmm. um, it takes quite a bit of effort, and it and it and they can push into the cooler season when it's drier. Mm -hmm. It just does not do well in that the heat and that high humidity. Um, you know, heading uh, in in the summer. Um, apples again, and I know people have apple trees they've got mm -hmm. them here and there and they're perfectly fine but you're not going to get your apples that you want or you might get one or two off there um you know because we do have to have um uh, cold hours. hours right yeah we've got to have those chilling hours down below 45 degrees and that doesn't mean one hour or two hour you know here and there you need some extended times down down pretty cold and we typically just don't get that that's the same with peaches. We have had people grow peaches here, even commercially, but a peach tree is generally going to live 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and that's it. And, you know, if you if you look, there are, like with peaches, UF has, has done pretty extensive breeding to mm -hmm. try to find those cultivars that, 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 less chilling hours. that need fewer mm -hmm. chilling hours that you can push and we do have a couple of pretty good varieties um you know for for um you know backyard fruit and stuff a peach tree here and there you know i think you know it's very very doable um but again those those take quite a bit of maintenance too um, right you know if you want to get production um of any type it, it takes some maintenance and some effort that's going to have to be your hobby but don't expect it to outlive you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And those kinds, you know, those kinds of plants, um, they're, they're kind of a beacon for every insect and every disease just loves them. And especially when you're pushing them out of their comfort zone, they're more susceptible, you know, and it's, it's kind of like with us in, in, in some ways, 
very generalizing this, but you know, when we're kind of weak, when we don't have the best nutrition, we're not where we need to be, where we want to be, we don't feel so good, we're much more susceptible um, to, to other things creeping in and, and taking a toll on us too. And I think, you know, the, the, the worst part about that is not just the loss or, or the plant kind of suffering, and people get frustrated with that, but they tend to start to throw the kitchen sink at it. Yeah. And that's a slippery slope. Um, you know, um, um, a colleague and, and, and I, Jim Mall here in Pasco County, we talk about this all the time. And, uh, you know, the fact that when a plant starts to suffer, people look at it and go, well, it must need more water. So they start throwing water at it. And water is not typically the answer. Um, more water is usually more of a problem than too little water is what I find. You know, and then when they go, well, that didn't help. Well, I'll put some fertilizer on it and they throw fertilizer at it. And the worst thing you can do to a suffering plant is tell it to grow by giving a bunch of nutrients um, because it's going to exhaust its carbohydrate source and it just starves itself, basically. So if the fertilizer didn't work, usually makes it worse. They go, well, there must be a disease. There must be an insect. But they, they don't have any identification of this. They don't have necessarily indication other than the plant suffering. They put pesticides out in the environment that are not necessary. So there's, you know, these contamination issues, runoff and leaching, um, damage into our waterways, um, which is quite significant um, here in Florida. So, you know, um, it it's the, the landscape maintenance is not as cut and dry and, and clear as people want it to be. You, you have to have some answers. Um, and have some knowledge when you're doing this stuff to do it right, not just for your plants, but also for the environment. Mm -hmm. And that's where extension comes in. Right. And that's what Jim says, right plant, right place, right care. Absolutely. And yeah, I, add sure, right right. Yeah, I add right. in right time. I add in right time. Right time mm -hmm. for fertilizing, right time for pruning, right time for planting. Um, you know, right right time, seasonality is is critical. Um, right, to get our right plant product, started. right problem. Absolutely. Yeah. And many times it's, it's easy for us if you bring a sample or send really good pictures where we can see what the problem is. You know, somebody brings in a plant and it has scale on it. I look under the microscope and I can figure that out right away and we can yeah. give them a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Because what you have in your shed may or may not be the correct control for scales. Yes. But I talked about LFI on from 1996. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't use that. <laughs> I'll talk to people who have a plant or a hedge that has a problem and they spray an insecticide and they have no idea if it had an insect. And we have no recommendations for imaginary insects. Yeah. So Absolutely. I tell people if you can't drop it in my hand so that I can look at it and figure out what it is, then it's an imaginary insect and there's mm -hmm. no good mm -hmm. control for it. Well, and that's kind of, you know, dead plants don't talk either, um, you know, yeah. it's, you know, um, especially when we're, we're talking potential for disease, people bring me something, you know, and they'll say, was it diseased? I have no idea because once something dies, you know, you've got bacteria, you've got fungi, you've got all these things that are natural decomposers. Their job is to get rid of this stuff and we need them. And they come in secondary on this and there's dozens of things growing on it. By the time I get it, I can't tell you if something killed it and what it could have been. So earlier, you know, um, that you can bring me something or send me pictures, the m more chance we can get out ahead of it um, and, and help with a recommendation to correct the situation. And this is what I tell people. You got to spend a little time with your landscaping. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think. People are kind of used to that if they're growing vegetables or something because they're they're looking every day for that tomato to show up or the little cucumber or something. So they're, you know, expecting something different more frequently. But you do have to walk through and, and just take a look at your plants. I mean, it's nice to be outside. It's not like it's a hard thing to do. Um, spend a little time because, again, these are investments, Mm -hmm. These are investments um, in, into your home and into the environment as well, um, because they do play some very critical roles um, for for other living things in the environment. And 
um, you know, spend some time, turn over a leaf here and there. A lot of things, you know, if you've got insects that like to hide under those leaves, turn over a leaf. You know, pull the branches apart. Get your head down in there and kind of look around. Look for broken branches, diseased branches, you know. Um, take a look around so you know the normal plant. Um, and then the odd things that are not normal will start to stand out to you more um, in the landscape. And you'll go, hmm, that looks a little different than it did yesterday. Something's changed. Um, you know, and, and that's when you can start to really get out ahead of this stuff. Yeah, and the earlier you catch any kind of problem, the easier it is Absolutely. to control. It's really difficult for us to make recommendations if your entire lawn is dead. <laughs> or, well, uh, actually, it's not, Bill. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's dead. kind of not, I guess. It's dead. Right. Dude, yeah. dude. You you're, you're both your pathologists. Insects. You're not forensic. Uh, <laughs> I had a lady bring a potted milkweed, and it was a small, maybe foot tall plant in a pot to the office, and it had spider mites, but mm. it was completely covered in webbing. I've never seen a plant completely, you couldn't hardly see the leaves through all the webbing. Wow. I said, You have spider mites, and you have so many spider mites, you're probably not going to be able to get it under control and save this plant. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. had they been diligent and gone out there with a, a magnifying glass or a hand lens and kept a close look on their garden and caught spider mites very early, they're very easy to control. Mm -hmm. And you can live with a few spider mites. It's just you have to watch them because they reproduce so quickly mm -hmm. when the that environmental point. conditions are perfect. Yeah, oh, in a week. Boom, you could have an explosion, explosion of spider mites or aphids or scales or mealybugs. Mm -hmm. But catching those point, things early. Yeah. yeah. It becomes a matter of you spent seven dollars for the plant, how much you want to spend to try <laughs> exactly. and save it. You know, yeah. I think that's a really good point too that that y'all are, are talking about here. You know, there are times and I think I shock people sometimes <laughs> because okay. they'll, you know, they'll have a tree issue or something like that and they come in and of course they're looking for a solution that is cost effective, of course, and is going to save that plant. Sometimes there's no saving it. That does happen. And that can be quite painful for folks um, financially. It mm -hmm. can also be painful because, you know, we put some sentiment onto our plants. Um, you know, um, sometimes they're you know, planted as a memorial or something like that. And, and people really take it personal um, when they lose these plants. These are living things. And I, I totally get that. But there are times that, you know, I'm like, OK, um, it's, it's pretty much past its prime here. Time, time to let it go. And I think it shocks people that I'm not like, well, let's throw that kitchen sink at it. Let's try to baby it along or something. There is a point that it's, you know, no return. Are there times you could really, really baby it and take care of it and maybe rescue it? There's potential there, but, you know, you have to kind of take the full picture into account. If you've not really had the time and been able to watch it before it got so bad, are you really going to take that time and money now to try to save it? You know, maybe it's time to let it go and put it out of its misery and your misery and let's you know, let's let it go because, you know, I have concern of people wasting water, wasting, putting fertilizer out and pesticide out that's really just not necessary. Um, and, you know, there's a financial toll. It does add up when you start um, going and buying this stuff and people will, you know, purchase pesticides and fertilizers and think that they'll last forever. They don't. They go bad mm -hmm. relatively quickly. Then we're left with something that's not going to be effective a year down the road when you try to put it out. Um, and something that you've got to try to get rid of in a safe way. So, you know, I, I kind of try to err on the more conservative side of, of um, recommendations sometimes. And really try to talk on a personal level with each client as to, why are you trying to save it? Why is it necessary? What's the situation here? Let's talk this through to see if this is something we really want to rescue or let's let this go and try something else. And a lot of times it just comes down to the fact that it just wasn't the right plant for the right place. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's find something that fits here, that fits for you and works for the plant. And it's a win-win. 
removing underperformers is part of, you know, having a Florida friendly yard too. And you got to consider how it may affect because it's all one environment, you know, your other plants as yeah. well. I yeah. tell people, well, um, well, Jim Mall says the difference between a professional and uh, just a homeowner is the size of the compost pile. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. But what I do is I still try to give it a chance. So I say I put an underperforming plant on a work plan. <laughs> like, You're not working out here with us. So we're going to put you in this other department. <laughs> but That's a good way to say it. still yeah. on probation. Yeah. So if you yeah. don't straighten up, well, then it's the compost department for mm -hmm. you. <laughs> yeah. we'll slip the plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, sometimes it's, it's just not practical. I'll speak with people who have some kind of tree issue and they're asking what can they spray their tree with for tent caterpillars or uh, saw webworm or uh, the webworms up in trees. Yeah. I spoke with a gentleman. He said he was like 70 years old. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not going to recommend that you break out the ladder mm -hmm. and the backpack sprayer and climb up into the tree to mm -hmm. spray it. It's just not practical. No. And even to hire a service to come and spray, they can be very, very expensive. Yeah. And, I and mean, they don't always. With that kind of thing, too, I mean, you're talking about a, a full canopy in a tree. You, you, you're you going to have to bring in a, a plane, a crop duster, basically. Yeah, yeah. You know, to get a really good coverage. And, and then there, you know, there's some safety issues with that, too, especially yeah, if somebody's trying to do it themselves. And, you know, drift comes back in into your face or goes onto the neighbor's property and you might have some other issues there. Yeah, sometimes it's either just not necessary, um, you know, and you just kind of have to live with the mess, um, you know, with the caterpillars and stuff. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people and, and people, I, I get a lot of calls of people wanting to spray oak trees to prevent leaf drop. I get what? a lot of calls about that. I don't and generally get them. Yes. Well, they're live oaks. They're supposed to keep the leaves forever, aren't they? <laughs> well, they're in neighborhoods a lot of times to where, you know, the leaves on the oaks, once the, you know, and they, and they shed year round for the most oh. part. Most of them do. But then, you know, at certain times they just drop. It looks it's like there could be a, a leaf drop. left. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. just that that drop all of a sudden and um you know their hoa is wanting you know rake the yard they don't want to be out there every day raking the yard um you know gets on the cars um and they will cause some spotting on vehicles and okay. you know break down your um windshield wipers they're quite acidic um you know and and they'll you know muddle muddle up your driveway and cause you to have to get out there and spray it off more often and stuff and so the last few years, you know, I found kind of what I what I call these snake oils that people are finding somewhere in the the dark recesses of the internet. I think <laughs> of you know spray your oak tree and prevent leaf drop, and it's like no, that's not gonna happen. No, that's part called of the uh, dark web. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's like, no, I haven't seen anything that prevents nature from taking its course yet. So, uh, well, there's one thing that will prevent the leaf drop. Yes, one thing. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot. That's going to be my recommendation yeah. to folks. And and sometimes, again, I think I just really shock them because you know the obvious answer, the easiest answer is one cut prune. Right. Take down the tree, and I don't mean to be so glib about it, but that's just the fact. Um, if it bothers you, if it's a maintenance issue, if you don't have time, if you are maybe an older adult and this is just too hard, and you don't have the financial financial means to pay somebody to do this for you, which is understandable, that's when you have to make some hard decisions and say the investment is more wise to take it down and plant something that's much more manageable. Mm -hmm. Or not plant anything at all. Um, it's okay. Small or live with it. Well. <laughs> Those are your choices. Live yes. with it. Yeah. Yeah. If you want a tree, it doesn't have to be an oak tree. There are yes. plenty of smaller trees. Yes. That are much easier to manage and care for that are going to do very well. That are, are underplanted. You don't see a lot. Of them. Absolutely. We have some really pretty smaller native trees mm -hmm. that that are 
beautiful. I think, you know, people want kind of that, that look of these, these old ancient oaks swooping down across the ground. Well, if you live on a postage stamp lot, that's not ever going to work out. <laughs> um, you know, it's going to, it can break up foundations of homes, break up infrastructure on roads and sidewalks. Um, could that's be messy. Exactly what's happening. We have a community that's about 30 years old. And when it was being built, they're, you know, in a in trying to do the right thing, the county said they had to have a certain amount of majestic trees. Sure. So they planted live oaks in these villas, in these postage stamp lots, and now they're breaking up the sidewalks. They're interfering with the, you know, foundations of the homes. And it, talk about wrong plant, wrong place. Yeah, and that's a financial nightmare. And, the, you know, and the other aspect of this with our landscapes is, and we really like drives me nuts as I drive around and this is not just a Florida issue this is everywhere but I think more Florida than anywhere um, you know we really like an instant gratification when we're installing landscaping and we don't take into account that this is going to mature and a year from now the landscape's going to look different five years from now that landscape's going to look really different ten years from now thirty years from now it's going to be a very different landscape. And are we prepared and do we understand its needs years from now? And if I can look and go, wow, I don't have much room here. In 30 years, if I had an oak tree, it would overpower everything. Then don't put the oak there to begin with. Mm -hmm. Or understand that 10 years from now, probably you're going to have to take it down. And there's a pretty extensive cost and process involved there. You've got to plan your landscaping for maintenance and and what you want it to look like years from down the road. And don't overplant it. Don't <laughs> overplant it. I would say we've got 30 to 50 percent more plants in a lot of the landscapes early on than we ever need. Um, you know, and, and we don't take into account the fact that they're going to grow in, they're going to mature, they're not going to be, you know, airflow between them. We're going to have more disease pressure, insect pressure. We're going to end up with a jungle down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and, and hiding and, hiding places, which can create a safety issue. Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. So, you know, you have to, it's not about today. It's about years from now. And, um, you know, last year um, uh, we were fortunate enough. Um, we took a group of master gardeners to England and there was these, you know, majestic estates. And you're walking around and you're looking at these plants. Many of them are just ancient, um, just gorgeous immaculately maintained. I mean, we, we saw one woman seriously with a pair of shears cutting the grass. Oh Unbelievable. God. Now, this was, I think, at the Rothschild estate. So I'm sure we're not looking to do that. Let's not plan <laughs> for that here. But that you're literally down there cutting with a pair of shears on this this long swath of, of, of grass. But um, there was this one particular estate that the landscape architect over 300 years ago imagined what it would look like today. Wow. And designed it and planted oh, wow. these specific trees to frame statues and artwork. And just now today is that reality being played out with those species and the artistic and harmonious value of that. And it's just unbelievably beautiful. Um, you know, so it, it, you've got to imagine down the road and what is the function? What do you need this to function at? as and what do you want it to look like later not today and and give it time these are living things you got to give it a little time a little patience yeah i see things at the other end of the spectrum sometimes a lot of neighborhoods when they're being built they'll install live oak trees in that little strip of grass between the sidewalk and the street and for a couple of years it looks great mm -hmm. when the oaks are small but 10 20 years down the road when the oak trees are popping up all the sidewalks in the neighborhood, they'll call us and they're, they're the only solution is to remove the trees. Yeah. They say, well, we got a quote for that for the whole neighborhood. It, yeah. And everybody goes into sticker shock. 
and they have to, you know, assess HOA fees to cover the costs. Mm -hmm. Just it's poor, painful. poor planning, poor planning. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. painful. And, and again, I think a lot of times that's, you know, because folks are um, trying, they have intent that's good. Yeah, yeah. They really do, but you know that's where you've got to to bring in these folks like Extension that can say, "Are you keeping these other things in mind here? These other principles of of how this is going to play out down the road?" Um, because it it that sticker shock, like you said, it it can be painful, and I have seen some really sad situations to where homeowners are saddled with an extreme cost. Mm -hmm. um associated you know with with poor planting early on and it is it is a significant burden mm -hmm. i and was even, just even cindy running. points out that even if you start with a little teeny tiny bare root <laughs> tree which i know we give away every year for arbor day 30 years later trees grow they will yeah. grow to whatever mature size they get to be depending on yep. the tree it's a very yeah. good point they're like I was in um, October, I spent some time at my daughter's in Pennsylvania, and she has, she lives, you know, like in a town, so she has a three-story house, but basically no yard, and this tiny piece of yard um, beside her house where she had a uh, Japanese maple. I don't know how old it was. It wasn't very big. It didn't have room to get real large, but... Um, now, the house was built in 1900. I'm sure the tree wasn't that old. Mm -hmm. But um, she's like, why isn't it, you know, changing color like it should be? So I went over and looked at it. And Bill's laughing because I sent him a picture. Yeah, I mean, picture. <laughs> sap was just pouring out of the, the crotch of the tree. And plus, um, the bark was exfoliating. I mean, coming off in big chunks. Mm -hmm. So just to be sure, I sent Dr. Lester a picture. And I sent... Jim Mall a picture just to, you know, have some backup. And Bill's like, well, you know, that's not supposed to be that. <laughs> that's never a good thing when the bark is coming off. And Jim told me I'll take painfully um, obvious answers for 500. <laughs> so, yeah. so anyway, um, and she has such, she lives a couple blocks from a river. So it's just like chunky clay soil, hardly oh. any room. She's had um, sewer backups probably right there. So I'm pretty sure it was a root rot issue. So it wasn't horribly expensive because it was a small tree and we have relatives up there with chainsaws. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but you know, then I get accused from the family like, oh, my gosh, the tree hugger actually yeah. <laughs> you know, gave yeah. the tree a death sentence. And yeah. I said, no, 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 it was euthanasia. Yeah, <laughs> but, putting it out of its misery. If, if I remember right. It wasn't bleeding. It was gushing, <laughs> like a yes. tidal wave leaking out of it. Yeah, so, it was out, I, I really didn't know what was wrong with it, but that looks like a terminal kind of issue. It was screaming. It was screaming for relief. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, but it was shoved in such a small area that once we had it out, you know, we both looked at it and we're like, "There is no need to put anything else in its place." Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, trees up north. Tree. Oh, that's what she planted from the Arbor Day. In your yeah. house. Yeah, trees can have their roots get into your septic system. You want to be very careful with that. Here in Florida, we have a lot of septics, and you don't you don't want tree roots oh, yeah. or any kind of roots in your drain field. Absolutely. I noticed I Cindy said she was embarrassed. Um, <laughs> with the 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 cotton tree there. I don't think I've read that was one of the ones that's become invasive. The cotton trees, yes. like in the Midwest, yes, and they do they spread those that white fluff everywhere. Now a lot of like movie makers, you know, had a good time with that. They make all kind of nice scenes with all that sure, fluff yes. going mm -hmm. around. But yeah, growing up in, in southern Kentucky, we had quite a few of those, you know, around the house, and um, it it. It was a nightmare because when it would start just raining down all this fluff, it would coat the car and the sap is um, just, it's almost like pine tar. You cannot get it off. And it, it's a nightmare for a good month um, whenever that starts. And um, 
So, yeah, I mean, they're pretty trees and they grow fast. Those poplars mm-hmm. grow so fast, several feet a year. Um, yeah. But um, again, you know, you, you really, you really, the devil's in the details is what we say. Mm-hmm. Do before you plant anything, you got to do just five minutes of research. Look at some some fact sheets from the University of Florida. Just yep. Google Google poplar tree and 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 IFAS I F A S, and it's going to pop up with information, and you're going to find out if it's invasive or not. Um, you're going to find out, you know, its maintenance requirements, what's normal for the plant, not. What are some of the common disease and pest issues? Some plants are are almost bulletproof. Others have some major problems and you know it's going to tell you what's its mature height what's its mature Mm -hmm. spread you know um what kinds of conditions does it prefer and if you don't have that condition for it don't plant it so you know you you but you'll be able to find alternatives that way too so um you know it's just because we want it doesn't mean we need it um you know i i kind of always say you know plants especially trees are a lot like puppies they're very cute when they're little, um, but they do grow up <laughs> and they do take some money. Um, so, gosh. It's... And Cindy said it was at her first house and Rutgers was her extension. So I guess she's been dealing with extension for quite some time. Excellent. Excellent. It's always good to hear. And you know, I think a lot of people just still don't don't really understand extension um which is which is unfortunate well over a hundred year old institution um you know uh, where you know we had some some folks way 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 back with forethought when land grant universities were first getting started across the country to say it'd be a shame if all of this great research and phenomenal teaching just stays on campus Let's work with community partners and community government, county governments to bring that information where it's going to actually be put to good use. And, you know, so you end up with extension service across the whole country. It's an extension of your land grant university. And uh, Rutgers got some great colleagues up there at Rutgers and, you know, all across the country. And, um, you know, uh, extension folks, extension agents and, and staff, we, we've got servants' hearts. So, uh, we're we're here to to help and come to us first yeah don't come to us as a last resort so many people will say why didn't i call you first and it's like Mm -hmm. oh i wish you had because we wouldn't be going down these these ugly roads some i end up sometimes i feel so bad because i feel like i'm the bearer of bad news all the time yeah you know um like oh that plant shouldn't have been put there you know you're going to have a major problem and uh you know, I, I hate it, but I always try to to temper what I have to say um, to yeah. folks and, and try to find some solutions, try to get creative with some alternatives um, to, to, to help folks as much as we possibly can. Yeah, sometimes they start with, well, my neighbor said this and my lawn guy said this and my brother-in-law in New York said this yeah. and yeah. I'll look at it and tell them exactly what it is and how everybody else was not quite correct with their diagnosis. Well, you know, I have some people that really don't like to accept that either. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry. It's just the fact. Um, you know, came to me for a reason. Yeah, it came, so I'm just telling you the truth. You know, I, I wouldn't lie to you about it. Um, I think, you know, sometimes it's, well, just kill the messenger here and uh, I don't take it personal, but it's kind of like, oh, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, and I mean, I hear that a lot and we do have so many transplants from up north and what goes in Wisconsin or New York or New Jersey or Kentucky or wherever you're from, for that matter, does not apply in Florida. You pretty much flip everything on its head down here. Mm-hmm. Um People have this idea, oh, I can go to move to Florida and raise anything I want. It'd be so easy. And it doesn't have to be hard, but it, you know, it, it's a challenge. It's different than, than what people assume. I mean, um, you know, um, I often joke and say Florida is where everything bad goes to happen because people will, you know, come in with these expectations and it and it seems to go so sour and so bad on them so fast. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, you were talking earlier about, you know, how very specific we are here as far as growing things. 
I've always kind of jokingly referred to it as plant purgatory. That's, that's kind of where we are. There they go. Yeah, just dying well, out. Yeah. <laughs> Until the end, yeah. 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 And a lot of times it just takes a little bit of education and a little bit of a plan mm -hmm. and correct management. You know, um, and, yeah, I deal with so many law questions. It's all about managing. And what we hear all the time is nothing grows here. And when I hear that, I'm like, <clears throat> yeah, I look out the window like I see yeah. things growing. Well, I have people tell me all the time you can't grow tomatoes in Florida. Oh. And I'm like, that's a shock considering we've got pretty much the biggest tomato industry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there yeah. Is, you know, right down the Ruskin. Yeah. Um, it, you can't you know, grow in that, June. Yeah, yeah. And that <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. right off here, the June, July, and August. Yeah, you're yeah. trying to grow them in the summer. Right, right. Probably can't grow Abraham Lincoln variety that takes 120 days from transplants. Yeah. But yeah. I've grown, I, I grow cherry tomatoes and Roma tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, if I put the cherry tomatoes in at the right time of year and actually put a little bit of time and effort into them, I'll get buckets and buckets and yes. buckets. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But you know, and, and that's what I tell folks because they're all, they always seem so let down when I say, you know, we've got we've got two growing seasons compared to the rest of the country that has one. We've uh -huh. got two, and summer's not one of them, unless you're talking okra, a few of the beans, you know, sweet potatoes, which you can pretty much do about any time, you know. Um, but but we're lucky that we've got two growing mm -hmm. seasons, and that's the good time to be outside. Summer's not. Right. Um, the plants are smarter than we are, the vegetables Absolutely. Are. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, it's 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 tough going um, in the summer, but uh, people are always, they always seem to be so sad. It's like, you've not lived here for a summer, have you? <laughs> <laughs> it's miserable. You don't want to be outside. <laughs> you don't. But, you know, there are some, uh, you know, just talking tomatoes, there are some really cool um cultivars like the everglades tomato i don't know if y'all are familiar with those yeah, yeah yeah they're really popular now oh absolutely love them there there are so many different ones that you can plant different colors shapes sizes tastes mm -hmm. flavors um they're they're really actually quite fun um and then you know moving over into kind of the heirloom and 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 all that kind of good stuff so it, it's much easier much easier than we tend to make it mm -hmm. Yeah, my, yeah. My neighbor does a whole lot of. He's got a whole hydroponic system going on over there, um, and yeah, I mean, he I'll he pushes it like with. through mid June, but then he even knows he's done. You know, yeah. uh -huh. start all over. Yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. there are some interesting tropical vegetables you can grow in the heat of summer, mm -hmm. but people most people aren't very familiar with um the um uh calabasa. Mm -hmm. Uh, Seminole pumpkin. Yes. Uh, you other lemongrass. Lemongrass is more mm -hmm. of an herb, but I grew some from seed last spring. Mm -hmm. It's waist high now. It grew like a weed. It's just great. Uh, those are great plants, and you know, um, like the lemongrass. I I really enjoy um, things that have duality that that you know aren't don't just taste good, but also look good, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and can be part of our landscaping, some of these edibles um, in, in landscaping so they can have several functions to them, especially if you've got kind of a small space or something. And lemongrass is one of those that smells good, looks good, tastes good. Uh-huh. You know. Even harvested is essential in Thai cooking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if I lived in a subdivision and I had um, African iris, clumps out in the front yard, mm -hmm. they'd go and I'd be putting in lemongrass. Looks just as attractive, looks very similar. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bunch of grass, it's a decorative grass, mm -hmm. but it's edible too. Yes. And th there's a lot of those plants that are really underutilized. Cindy. So we have some more plugs here for extension in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Cindy's one of our regular viewers. Um, Cindy also used the one in Pennsylvania. Um, Great. And Pinellas County is Great. wonderful. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Teresa on here a few weeks ago, who's mm -hmm. with Pinellas County Extension. So, you know, we have an extension office in each county in Florida. So if you don't, if you're in a different county and you don't know how to get in contact with your office, if you contact us, we'll give you the, the phone number or the email address. You know, Cindy mentions there, especially during COVID times, and, and I will echo that, um, you know, 
it's been a it's been a tough tough year on everybody but i have to say extension you know has just stepped up this is when we shine right you know and and so many people i mean even university administration i think they've been shocked when they've heard we're we're clicking along we're doing good in the counties yeah because this is what we do we adapt and we're flexible and and we go with the flow of things so you know when when we had to shut down overnight we said okay we're virtual right. those services do not stop um for our clientele and in fact you know we we've we've been able to help some folks in some really tough situations even economically over the last few months that have have turned things around for them and for that i'm i'm incredibly proud not just of pasco extension but across the state and really across the nation this is what we were built for i know that uh the number of questions we've answered just doing it either over the phone or through email or through Facebook, which a lot of people have been asking us questions that way also. The number of questions we've answered this year has just absolutely gone through the roof. I know that the second quarter of 2020, I think the number of classes that we offered doubled, the number of participants tripled. Mm -hmm. So I know that we've had a lot of people who maybe weren't aware of us before Mm -hmm. Because in the past, when most of our programming and classes were like 10 in the morning on a Wednesday morning, either at our office or a local library, not everybody can make it in person then. Yeah. Yeah. But by doing things virtually, we're able to record it. We could put it on Facebook. We could put it on YouTube. So if yeah. you have to work, no matter what your schedule is, you can watch our videos, you know, our video recorded classes at 2 in the morning if you'd like to. Mm -hmm. The challenge about that is we can't do the same thing twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if you're interested in seeing what kind of classes we have coming up here in Hernando County, if you just go to HernandoExtension.com, that's a freestanding web page that is fed from our Facebook page. So all of our classes, as soon as we have them planned out, go there. And any information you need, because we do things through Zoom, we do things on Facebook Live, we post videos of, I know Lily posts videos of classes that she's done on Zoom. Everything you need to know, you're gonna be able to find there. So that's a great resource. And Whitney, I don't know if I, is this your correct email address? I just guessed um, Actually, one. there's a C, WC Elmore. Oh no. Okay, well then, here, let me... But they can find me. You, you're you thinking of my Pasco County email address. That's the W, W E. My UF is WCLmore at UFL.edu. There we there go. You there you go. go. <laughs> that was fast. fast. I know. <laughs> hey, StreamYard is a really, really fun platform, and I think we're going to be doing a lot more things on here. Put my email in since you love it so much, Bill. Okay, okay, your turn is coming up. Well, let me mention a few weeks ago. He hates my email. He thinks it's too long. <laughs> a few weeks ago, we had BJ Jarvis on here, who's the uh, extension director in Citrus County on the other side of us from Pasco. And her and Lily made the suggestion that we put together a cooking program. So. You know, that's not a bad idea. Actually, um, one of our really popular programs, um, we I really like to cross-market our programs in Pasco. So our community gardens program worked with our family and consumer sciences um, agent, and we did um, some live um, and also uh, tape those where they'd be on demand. Um, talking about how to grow your herbs, how to grow your veggies, and then we trans transferred that over into how to cook it, how to that's do that on a budget. That's what we were talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, and people absolutely yeah. loved it. If you could make it all seasonal and fresh from Florida and things that people can actually grow and be harvesting at that time of year from their gardens, mm -hmm. that ties in perfectly with all the classes that I've been involved with, with encouraging vegetable gardening, growing fruits, being more sustainable, um, improving your own personal food systems. So yes. um, resiliency. You know, mm -hmm. I'll get a hold of you and we'll talk about that. Absolutely. Here on StreamYard, it's really difficult to have a live camera. 
because I can have anybody join us. And if they're sitting in front of a steady camera, it works really well. Mm -hmm. But to do it live either from your phone or from an iPad becomes problematic. So the actual preparation, because in Pasco County, you have a commercial kitchen. Mm -hmm. there. If a 10 minute video is shot, I can show a video on here pretty easily, screen share it, but to do it live becomes a little bit of an issue. So. Yeah, and I mean, you can do everything else live and put that video sure. in and yeah, and make sure. it available. And I'll have it available for folks online afterward where they can go back and, and, and catch it and pick up any tips that they may have missed and they can just kind of follow along as they're actually cooking. But, uh, you know, we really always try to put that healthy twist on it. We also try to put that twist of how to, how to cook, or how to grow your own and do this on a budget. Um, you know, especially right now, folks, a lot of folks are struggling, mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, how do you do this healthy? How do you do this safe? We talk a lot of food safety, um, not just in the garden, but also in the kitchen. Um, you know, so so we try to walk through a wide variety, uh, kind of a holistic approach of, of gardening, um, you know, um, all the way to to fork, you know, from farm to fork here. Exactly. Even I got my vegetable garden going once again after COVID first set in mm -hmm. and doing pretty well because I have all cool season crops growing. Mm -hmm. So I do have a nice little crop of Swiss chard and kale. The broccoli is on the way and we're more than happy to share and tell everybody how to do that. Absolutely. Uh, and even get a couple cooking recipes in here also mm -hmm. for fun. Sure. So we have one last quick question here. If anybody else has a question, squeeze it in real quick. So do bougainvillea lose their leaves in winter? Thanks. Heard the doggy. No, um, they're, they're, they're awake. They're up from their yeah. I don't even hear them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. Uh, yeah. So with the bougainvillea, it kind of can depend on where you're at. Um, and there's definitely can be honestly a little bit of difference in age sometimes as to how they'll react. Um, typically in our area, I'm not sure, sure exactly where you're at in our area, they will not lose their leaves. They may shed some, but they won't typically lose all of them unless they get a pretty good frost on them. Mm -hmm. Um, and they'll go downhill pretty fast. If they get a frost, they'll turn brown to black on you relatively quickly and then they will drop in mass especially the ones on the outside of the plant leaves to them to closer to the interior typically won't necessarily drop um if it's just you know one light um frost or something like that but if you got a heavy enough freeze um absolutely you could you know drop every leaf on there um for sure if they're planted in the ground if it's not an extended freeze Typically in our area, they'll survive um, and be just fine. Now, if they're in a pot and you were pushing further north than maybe Pasco, um, you know, you, you could potentially lose one um, to, to cold in, in a pot or something. Um, further north you go, the, the higher the risk of, of losing those. Those are um, tropical to subtropical um, plants. Absolutely one of my favorite plants, except when it comes to pruning. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, those thorns, yeah. man. Um, but um, they grow. kind of define Miami, don't they? Huh? They, just, they kind of define Miami. Oh, yeah, they yeah. they yeah. framing. I mean, these are just some of the most beautiful plants to frame a doorway or a walkway, an entrance or something. Just you know, a pergola or something. Beautiful, beautiful plants. But uh, there's a, a good chance, you know, that they'll drop a great majority of their leaves. It's very yeah. freezes, the two freezes we've had so far in Hernando have been very short period of time where it's actually been 32, although we've had pretty heavy frosts, at least I have. I, there, I don't think anything has happened yet that are any kind of root killing, you know. It's yeah. just we're going to have to live with the ugly, yeah. and then they'll come back. In the yeah, absolutely. Bougainvillea are hardy. They're tough. Mm -hmm. Tough, tough, tough plants. Um you know, they, they take a lot of punishment from a lot of insects and stuff, um, and they just keep on ticking like nothing nothing's happened. Um, but and they're fun. If you put them in a spot where they're really happy, they will grow like weeds. Yes. You need to be careful um, where you put them. You put them way too close to a doorway, 
and you're going to be out there having to prune them a lot and you don't really want to do that because they do have a lot of big sharp thorns yes a couple and of years ago uh, bill and i visited um, a home where she had mm -hmm. had one planted right at the front door mm -hmm. and that that was just a monster taking yeah, yeah. They, they can take over when they get really really you know quite old they get very very woody um if you're not pruning them properly and even if you are over time they get very woody um, especially down toward the base thick um, and they'll sucker they yeah. tend to to sucker pretty bad here and there too um, and send up kind of some water sprouts and whatnot and um, so you know they they do need some maintenance they're uh, they're not what I'd say carefree but but pretty close to it um, compared to a lot of other things but you you have to prune them back um, pretty significantly you can almost sit and watch them growing in the summer yeah um, yeah they, they will grow fast. I mean, you'll blink and you'll have, you know, a stem that's eight feet long um, in no time. Okay. Well, there is no, one the press once again, if anybody needs to get in touch, uh, anybody has any other questions or feel free to contact uh, our office here. There's the phone number. If you call, Teresa will most likely answer the phone. And she is more than happy to help you out. And she does a great job of forwarding questions to either me or Lily, if it applies to her, so we can get your questions answered. Other than that, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Whitney, thank you so much yes, for sir. being on Anytime. here and helping out today. Anytime. And happy holidays. Yes, same to you. Happy <laughs> holidays to you, too, if I don't talk to you between now and then. Yes, and. Lily, I guess we'll see you back here again next week. Oh, I forgot. You're going to be on vacation next week. <laughs> yeah. That's Just okay. Because next week we have Maxine Hunter with Marion County Extension here. So, see, we're bouncing. We're bouncing north. All over the state. Yeah. 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 You, guys are, you guys are doing great. We're trying. This is a lot of fun. And like yeah. I said, we, we're, we're starting to gain a number of regular viewers, which is great. So just go ahead and save up your questions for Thursday. Um, feel free to email me pictures because I can share them on here for everybody to see. And we'll figure out exactly what your problem is and what you could do to fix it. So and you that, won't be meeting on the 24th. <laughs> you won't have this, but I think we agreed. You and I are both available on the, on the 31st. We will have this sure sure we'll be here for new year's eve yeah because it is Where 10 o'clock in the morning go? exactly, in the morning. exactly. <laughs> we've got nothing else to do we might as well do it. <laughs> all right guys y'all have a great day okay right, great. Thank you, thanks again see y'all next week Bye.